to Rating the List, where we review, discuss, and reimagine popular movie lists objectively. We're your hosts, I'm Jerry. And I'm Brad, and on this episode, we'll be exploring number 12 from AFI's 100 Years, 100 Passions, the 100 Greatest Love Stories of All Time. All right, number 12 is My Fair Lady, released in 1964, directed by George Cougar, starring Audrey Hepburn and Rex Harrison. The synopsis for this movie musical is as follows. In early 20th century London, phonetics professor Henry Higgins, played by Rex Harrison, believes the accent and tone of one's voice determines a person's prospects in society. During a chance encounter with fellow phonetics expert, Colonel Hugh Pickering, Higgins boasts he could teach Cockney flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, played by Aubrey Hepburn, to speak so well he could pass her off as a duchess at an embassy ball. Eliza's ambition is to work in a flower shop, but her accent makes that impossible. The next morning, Eliza shows up at Higgins' home requesting lessons. Pickering is intrigued and offers to cover all expenses if Higgins succeeds. Higgins agrees and describes how women ruin lives. Eliza's father, Alfred, learns of his daughter's new residence and shows up at Higgins' house ostensibly to protect his daughter's virtue, but in reality just wants a payday and is paid off with five pounds. Higgins is impressed by Alfred's honesty and gift of language, but especially his brazen lack of morals. Higgins recommends Alfred to a wealthy American who is interested in morality. Eliza endures Higgins' demanding methods and rough treatment. Just as she, Higgins, and Pickering are about to give up due to her lack of progress, she has a breakthrough and begins to speak with an impeccable upper-class accent. As a trial run, Higgins takes Eliza to Ascot Race Course. She initially makes a good impression, only to shock everyone when she has a lapse and falls into a vulgar cockney while cheering on a horse. Despite the outbursts, Freddie Einsford Hill becomes infatuated with her. Higgins then takes Eliza to an embassy ball for a final test. Zoltan Karpathy, a Hungarian phonetics expert trained by Higgins, is present at the party. He dances with Eliza, and though he is touted as an imposter detector, declares she is a Hungarian princess. Afterward, enraged by not being appreciated for her hard work and Higgins' continued callous treatment of her, Eliza leaves. Outside, she is met by Freddie, who irritates her because all he does is talk. She tries to return to her old life, but no longer fits in. She meets her father, who has been left a large fortune by the wealthy American to whom Higgins had recommended him, and is resigned to marrying Eliza's stepmother. Eliza eventually visits Higgins' mother, who is outraged by her son's behavior. The next day, Higgins finds Eliza has gone and goes searching for her, eventually finding her at his mother's home. He attempts to convince her to come back, but becomes angry when she announces that she is going to marry Freddy and become Carpathy's assistant. He makes his way home, stubbornly predicting she will come crawling back to him. He eventually comes to the unsettling realization that she has become an important part of his life. He reflects on his poor treatment of her, and missing her so much, he turns on his gramophone to hear her voice. Eliza suddenly appears and turns off the gramophone to get his attention. Okay. All right. So, so, you know, AFI, it's a love story list. There's really not a love story in this. There really isn't. There really isn't. There's um, a guy that's, like, infatuated with her once she becomes, you know, a aristocrat. Aristocrat. <laughs> <laughs> aristocrat. <laughs> um, and... Uh, What's his name in the movie, Rex Harrison's character? Uh, Higgins. Higgins. And Higgins is a dickhead. God, he's, I mean. He's like, so mean to her. Like he, the, he's, so, he's so mean and like the shit he says just like makes you laugh like the whole time. Yeah. But it's like the British. It, it, it's like that British like super hand, dry. Face slapping draw, you mean, know. Just like, I mean, they're just like, he just like. I mean, he's so, he's just so, so, so dry. And yeah, it's, it's very like, dry. It's it's easy to laugh at. Um, none of the characters are particularly likable. No, this is, so this is a, um, this is an, an adaption of Pygmalion, which is a 1913 play um, by, I think it was 
by George Bernard Shaw, if I remember right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. cool, cool. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's just, like, you just, you don't buy one that she has any... She really doesn't seem to have much affection for him at all. But like, why? Like, I don't understand. Why I she understand come. why. I'm like, okay, does she come back because the thought of being with Freddie is like so bad that she's just like, well, I mean, I mean, she could have just married Freddie and lived her life. Yeah, I mean, you just, know, I, it, <laughs> hey, to, to his credit, he 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 kind of knows what she is. Yeah, and he's just like, I find you interesting, and I want to, you know, yeah. I want to get to know you, and you know, he's. He's nice to her the entire time. Yeah. She could do a hell of a lot worse uh, yeah. than Freddie, including Higgins. going back to Higgins, which is, always pisses me off. Which is movies. weird. So now what? Is she just going to live there? And Yeah. Are they going to be romantically involved? Is she just working for him? What's the deal? I don't understand what there's, the deal there's is. There's no indication. Like, that are they, they just going to be BFFs forever? There's no indication that there is a romantic connection between the two of them. It's not implied in the text. It's not implied by the, the actors on screen. Mm -mm. It's not implied in the songs. It's really not. No. Like, at any point. No, it's not. And let's talk about the songs. Okay. So, this is a musical, so obviously there's a lot of, you know, musical elements. They are so freaking long. They're really long. They're super long. The like musical numbers them. just don't stop. Like, the one with her dad, who's, like, going around, and he's like... A little bit luck. That one, <laughs> it's like never it's, ending. It's like a good. It's ten. like how big is the city that he's gonna run around? It's not just. It's like ten minutes long. It's like a ten minute. Song. That doesn't really add anything to the story. Most of the songs don't. That's yeah. the thing. Like any. It's very out of context. Any of the songs that don't involve either him or her, for the most part, don't. Yeah. And even some of them don't. It's like, what? A, and also, Audrey Hepburn's Cockney accent. I understand that she's laying it on thick to make a point that's so atrocious that it's a challenge for Higgins to change her dialect, but... She sounds like someone who speaks properly doing a Cockney accent. Yeah, she sounds right. terrible, and it's so annoying. Like, if you've, like, if you've ever seen any performance that has true Cockney in it, they uh, they sometimes have to subtitle it. Yeah, you can't understand anything they're saying. It's like listening to someone from parts of the deep south. Yeah, who they they mumble their words and stuff, or some like like a Creole, like where you know, like when you watch that show. What's that show? Like the 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 reality shows, the like Duck, Dan Duck Dynasty, Duck Dynasty and stuff. They have to subtitle. Like they're they're almost like Boomhauer from. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then it's like they're doing it for laughs, but it's it gets old. Like the first only, minute, okay, yeah, that's funny. But not then, only does it get old, but it's like it's condescending. It's like just yeah. because someone has a Cockney accent doesn't mean they're they're Dumb. not intelligent or don't you know? It's just weird. It's it, yeah, it's very strange. It's very, I don't. Know, it it's a weird movie. Not only that, there was this weird thing that went on in the nineteen fifties and sixties where actresses voices singing voices were dubbed right. and this is one of them and this is a weird one too because some of the time when they did that the actress wasn't known for their singing audrey hepburn could sing i mean she, like you know we we had a movie of, of hers on the list earlier moon river she sings moon river that is her singing that yeah. song yeah and it's fine so basically so what they had told her was, so they they told her halfway through the movie as they were filming it that we're going to dub your voice. And she was very upset and she walked off the set. Yeah, I mean, honestly, And then she came back and was like, all right, I'm acting stupid. Yeah, let's whatever. But she said in an interview that if she had known that before she took the job, she, she would not have, have yeah. taken the job. And the person that they dubbed it with, her name is... Marnie Nixon, who also her voice was used in The King and I for Deborah Kerr. Mm. Um, 
she's the one that dubs it. She did a lot of voiceover in this time. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful voice. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of common practice. I guess they just needed the star power mm -hmm. of the actor. They did tell Aud Audrey Hepburn that her, sh her voice wasn't strong enough for these songs. So that's why they had to dub her. But like, who knows? My thing, like my thing with movie musicals is like, look, if you're going to put an actor or actress into that role, they need to be able to do it. Now, a lot of actors and actresses can sing, can dance. Mm -hmm. They grew up in musical theater. Yeah. They know how to do this. You, It's not that difficult, especially like, you know, English theater, there's like all kinds of it. It's like well, and then Rex Harrison doesn't really sing anything. He just kind of words it. Yeah, he's you know he he doesn't like you know he he gets away with just basically like almost like talking through it. Just talking through it, which again is just like yeah. What? It's, yeah. I mean, it's it doesn't. It's make a strange sense. movie. Um, the production value is super high. Production it value is high. Looks really great. It does. It um, does. The costuming. The costuming, the dance numbers, all of that. And then they do this weird stuff in the middle, like at the race oh, track. Oh, that's, that's bizarre. That was weird. Like everybody's sitting still and then just singing. Yeah. It, it It's very, very strange. Felt, I think they it, were going like felt, Art Deco or it something. It felt cultish. It was weird. It did feel cultish. I think it was the product of the 60s. Mm. I feel like they did things like that. Like it felt very... um. Which is weird. What's that movie? I know what you're talking about, but like for me, like it, I didn't think that was like I thought that was more of an American kind of deal than a British one. Yeah, what's that movie? No, it's it's pretty British. This movie is British. It's that oh, Clockwork Orange. It had that kind of feel to it. I don't know. Mm. Even though it's not like about serial killers in any way, mm. but like it just felt out of place. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's a. It's fine. I mean, I was I was very surprised. Like, it it keeps surprising me as we go through these lists. Like, you know, like she enjoys movie musicals way more than I do. Um, me for my whole thing is you know musicals work much better in a live setting on mm -hmm. a stage rather than yeah. a film. Um, but she had never seen this one before. I had not, and it's so funny because it's like just like the sound of music. Like I don't know if I was like rebelling or what, but like my mom and my sister love sound of music. My mom had this on like a double VHS tape, yeah. and I never watched it. That's how, that's how Jerry raged against the machine. She I went, guess she wouldn't watch. I'm like movie. I'm not watching your musical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not watching it. So, but yeah. Um, so, uh, I gave this one a 58, and Jerry gave it a 35. I think I appreciated the craftsmanship of the movie a little bit more than she did. Yeah. Um, so, the list score is 46 and a half. Yeah. And can we stop trying to make Audrey Hepburn happen? <laughs> like, okay. Like, she was gorgeous. Okay, She's dead. I know. I'm sorry. That's rude. <laughs> Sorry, Audrey Hepburn she already, and her family. She already happened. She already happened. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I need to get over it. Anyway, I think that's it. That was number 12, My Fair Lady. If you have any comments, please leave a comment below. Let us know what you think of My Fair Lady. Um, if you want to talk to us directly, please email us at ratingthelist at gmail.com. And we'll get back to you with a little bit of luck. <laughs> she hates this song. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm Jerry. I'm Brad. And we'll, we're rating the list. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.